Explosions. Big balls of rapidly expanding high pressure gas, light and assorted shrapnel, that somehow manage to combine terrifying destructiveness and captivating visual beauty. I've always been fascinated by explosions, and if you've clicked on this video, there's a better than even chance that you like them as well. Over the years, this fascination of mine has developed into a sort of inner sense that's always on the lookout for explosions or anything really with explosive potential. And it just so happens that the last time this inner sense went off was during my recent read-through of the novel Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. So let's talk about that. For those of you unfamiliar with Project Hail Mary, the novel starts out with our lovely neighborhood ball of burning plasma, the sun, which one day inexplicably begins to dim. After some quick science, humanity figures out that the sun has actually been infected by an alien, light-absorbing amoeba dubbed astrophage, which is Greek for star eater. It quickly becomes clear that if left unchecked, the astrophage will continue to multiply, block out ever more sunlight, to the point where the Earth will freeze over. Since in this alternate reality, people apparently aren't huge fans of freezing to death, they mount a science expedition to fix the astrophage problem, named Project Hail Mary. Get it? Because if the expedition fails, everyone dies? So anyway, humanity figures out that Astrophage has vast energy storage capabilities, which makes it an excellent fuel source. They breed up a whole bunch of the stuff in solar farms across the Sahara Desert, use it to fill up a starship, and send it on its way to Tau Ceti, the theorized origin point of Astrophage, in hopes of finding a solution. Sure enough, over the course of the two decades that it takes the expedition to reach its destination, find a cure, and send it back to Earth, humanity on our little mud ball comes together in idyllic harmony despite ever-dwindling resources and worsening living conditions, until the sun is finally fixed and everyone lives happily ever after. Now that you're caught up to speed on the events of Project Hail Mary, you've probably noticed that throughout the novel, Andy Weir presented humanity in a very positive, perhaps even idealized light and in the process kind of glossed over the fact that throughout history, humanity has basically tried to weaponize every single thing that we've ever come across. I mean, give us a stone and we'll carve a hand axe out of it. Give us a stick and we'll sharpen it into a spear. Give us a lump of glowing rock and we'll delete an atoll from the map. And perhaps as a bit of an extreme example, just the other night I was watching TV and I saw this one guy kill three men in the bar with nothing but a pencil. A fuck! Where was I? Alright, oh, we can all agree that us humans will weaponize everything and anything we can get our hands on. So why would Astrophage be any different? If we rewind back a bit, you'll remember that I mentioned that Astrophage has a high energy density. But that description isn't quite right, because in actuality, Astrophage has a ludicrously insanely high energy density. To illustrate this a bit better, let's take dynamite as an example. Dynamite has an energy density of just about 4.6 megajoules per kilogram. That means if you took a kilogram, or roughly two pounds of dynamite, and set it off, the resulting explosion would yield 4.6 million joules of energy. In practical terms, that's enough energy to shoot a one kilogram, or two pound bar of steel, straight up into the air to an altitude of 290 miles. Astrophage, on the other hand, has an energy density of five, followed by 16 zeros, joules per kilogram, which is roughly 10 trillion times as much as what dynamite has. In practical terms, this means that if you wanted to achieve an explosion the same size of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, all you'd really need is one gram of astrophage, or 0.035 ounces for you imperialists out there. Now, I know what some of you out there might be thinking, Oh, but John, sure Astrophage has a ton of explosive potential, but what good is all that power if you have no way of detonating the thing in the first place? No. And you're absolutely correct. 
Part of the reason why today only a handful of countries have access to nukes is that making a thermonuclear explosion isn't as simple as bashing coconuts together. You've obviously got to get the special kind of radioactive coconuts and then bash them together really hard using explosives. And everyone knows that radioactive coconuts don't exactly grow on trees. So then, how complex of a detonation mechanism would you need for an astrophage-based bomb? Well, that strongly depends on how astrophage stores and releases energy, so let's take a look at that next. In the novel, it's explained that astrophage has two basic energy modes. The first of these is a low energy mode, and in this state, astrophage primarily absorbs external energy, mostly in the form of light, from stars like our Sun. This energy then gets stored inside the astrophage itself through a process where the raw light energy is used to generate a neutrino and antineutrino pair inside the astrophage's cell membrane. As more light is absorbed, more neutrino pairs get added, which all just kind of bounce around inside the astrophage's cell membrane until at some point the astrophage gets saturated and can't absorb any more light. In that moment, astrophage reverts to its second, high energy mode, in which it tries to navigate to the closest carbon dioxide rich atmosphere to reproduce. In this state, astrophage first needs an external stimulus to serve as a sort of navigation beacon, and this comes in the form of the spectral light signature of carbon dioxide. And once it detects that specific signature, it basically does the same thing we described earlier in the low energy mode, but in reverse. So, inside its cell membrane, the astrophage smashes together a neutrino and antineutrino pair, releasing their energy, and then spitting that energy outwards in the form of Petrova line frequency light to propel itself towards a suitable breeding environment. With all of that put together, the more creative among you will already have realized how to create an astrophage-based explosive. All you really need is a container, a bit of energy-rich astrophage, a powerful light, and a light filter that only lets through the specific light spectrum of carbon dioxide to initiate the release of energy. In the book, we actually kind of get to see this very detonation mechanism in action in the scene where the two scientists blow themselves up in the generator accident. But I hear you say, No, this all sounds wonderful, Bastian, but this is still all far too complex for me. I mean, where am I supposed to find all of these specific light filters? And if they're so dangerous, wouldn't the Earth's governments immediately seize them all and prohibit their sale? No. Well, fear not, my fellow explosives enthusiast, and follow me on a journey of educated speculation. Remember how we said that astrophages store their energy in the form of neutrino pairs trapped inside their cell membrane? Well, early on in the novel it's described that if you kill the astrophage cell, let's say by piercing its cell membrane with a needle, it would lose containment and in the process all the stored neutrinos would go shooting out in random directions. In the novel this is described as a totally benign occurrence but I pose a theory that in reality, this event would be far more volatile. Let's take this astrophage cell as our example. Right now, you can see that it's alive and well, and its cell membranes are filled to the brim with neutrinos and antineutrinos. Then we poke it with a needle, killing the organism and releasing all of those particles in random directions. The question I have now is how likely would it be for some of these previously contained antineutrinos to collide with some of their neutrino brethren or even neutrinos coming from deep space? Because for every such collision there would be a release of energy in the form of heat, that heat could further break down the astrophage cell and send parts of it flying in all directions to potentially hit the cell membranes of neighboring astrophage cells starting the cycle all over again in a devastating chain reaction. If all of that science checks out, then making an astrophage bomb could be as simple as getting a glob of astrophage and dousing it with hand disinfectant 
since alcohol essentially dissolves the cell membranes of single-celled organisms. Or if that's still too complex for you, you could put a blob of astrophage on a countertop and hit it with a hammer, and as long as you manage to damage one cell, it would detonate the whole thing. And honestly, with such a rudimentary detonation mechanism, there's probably an infinite amount of ways in which you could turn astrophage into some sort of explosive device. So, to summarize, in the world of Project Hail Mary, humanity gets its grubby hands on astrophage, the most powerful explosive substance in human history, with an explosive yield where one gram of the stuff is enough to level an entire city that can be detonated as simply as hitting it with a hammer, and the largest producers of the stuff are Saharan countries that can literally produce tons of energy-rich astrophage per year with the help of their solar panel breeders. Oh, and these same countries are about to be overrun by countless refugees from all across the globe in search of food, safety and shelter, as the polar ice caps continue to consume more and more of the planet's habitable landmass. And yeah, I can't see how anything could go wrong in that scenario. Thanks for watching and subscribe for more.